Hello everyone, my name is George Xu. I'm a PhD student from X Discovery Lab at Dartmouth College. Today, I'm going to present Tip Text, Ice Free Text Entry on a Fingertip Keyboard. This work was in collaboration with another co primary author, Pei Chong Wang, and Jun, Tian, Adi, Xiao Jun, Yogan, Hongbo, Kening, and my PhD advisor, Xing Dong Yang from Dartmouth College. Before talking about Tip Text, Let's quickly look back into the history of text input. In the past few decades, people are getting more and more familiar with typing on smaller devices. We used to type on typewriters at the very beginning, then on the physical keyboards for desktops and laptops, then on the cell phones with buttons, with touch screens, and now even on some wearable devices. Today, I'm going to show you that typing on fingertip is possible and not slow. This is our speculative future of how text entry on a fingertip will be. Within wearable devices, we can type by using our thumb tip, tapping on the index finger, even without looking at the fingertip. This is tip text. You can now type only with two fingertips. What you are looking at is the keyboard layout of tip text. The invisible keyboard was derived from a standard Cody keyboard by assigning all letters into six keys. Users rely on their natural spatial awareness to tap on the corresponding area. Only the entered text and the suggestion list are displayed to user. There's no visualized keyboard, there's no need to look at the fingertip, just rely on the proper section. This is why we call it ice free. To get a quick idea of how to use tip text, let's see a demo of typing hello. First, H is in the middle key of the second row, so the user taps the location where he or she thinks that key is supposed to be. H is not the only letter in that key, so we don't need to worry about the candidate for now. Then comes the letter E. The first L the second L, and letter O. We can see that hello is on the top of the candidate list. User needs to make a right swipe to select the ca first candidate. When typing the first letter of the next word, the selected word is committed automatically. Here it is. I will talk more details about our keyboard design and prototype later. Before that, let's talk about the motivation. We believe that microfinger gesture is going to be the mainstream of future mobile interactions. Several years ago, Google has proposed its solid project for sensing microfinger gesture, and now it's on commercial products. And two years ago at WIS, my lab mate Jin also proposed another micro gesture sensing technique. Meanwhile, our collaborators, Yogan and Adi, have worked on interactive skin for many years. We can imagine that in the future, our fingertips can be wrapped with interactive skin, which makes microfinger gesture even more practical. All these research efforts make us think of the following questions. What else can microfinger gesture do in the future? Maybe use it for chatting, online surfing, or texting. We re really want to see that whether microfinger gesture is feasible for text entry. To develop a text entry measure, the first question comes up to our minds is, what is the proper keyboard layout? Designing a fingertip keyboard has many obvious challenges, including missing proper haptic feedback, lack of rigid and flat surface, but the most pressing issue is the lack of input space. This will bring a very serious clarity issue. For example, if user wants to type word in on a Cody keyboard, he or she needs to tap the letter I first. The circle here represents the contact area of user's thumb tip. We can see it can be so large that it covers several letters. Then the letter N. The small figure here 
are the touch point distributions of 26 key we collected in a user study, which I will talk about it later. So we can see that since letter I and O are so close to each other, even with the statistical decoder, it can still be too hard to recognize whether the intended word is in or on. So we want to find the optimal keyboard layout with the statistical decoder that can minimize this issue. The principal equation of a statistical decoder is here. The basic idea of it is to accept user input, usually at several touch points of the target word in 2D coordinates, and return a list of suggestion words based on that input. Let's see a quick example here. If the user wants to input word hello, five touch points related to letters are passed into the statistical decoder. Then it returns a li list of suggestions. In, in this case, hello ranks top among the suggestion list. This is good because a high ranking helps user quickly find the words they want without wasting time on searching along the suggestion list. But for another keyboard with serious clarity issue, the hello may rank lower among the suggestion list. This is not what we want. Building a statistical decoder for each candidate layout is not feasible in a lab experiment. Thus, we apply a simulation-based approach where we simulate a user is typing words and see what the statistical decoder will provide. This is our metric that quantitatively scores every candidate layout based on how serious the clarity issue is. Within the metric, we then need to determine our candidate layouts. A very intuitive choice comes up first, a 26-key QWERTY keyboard. But is it possible on a fingertip? We need to collect data to run the simulation before giving the answer. We conducted a user study to collect ice-free typing data for a QWERTY keyboard. For user study, we need some sort of sensing technique. We use Vicon, the motion tracking system, to track the movement of users' fingertips and use Unity to compute the touch point location. This approach helps us avoid placing an overlay on the user's fingertips and reducing haptic feedback. In details, we first made clay models for each participant's fingertips and scanned them using a laser scanner for digital 3D models. In the study, Vicon will track the movement of users' two fingertips and fed the data to control 3D models in Unity. Unity computed a 3D coordinate of the touch point when two mesh collides with each other and turns it into a relative 2D coordinate according to users' finger size. Ten participants were involved in this study to type 40 phrases randomly picked from McKenzie's free set. Users were required to finish the task without looking at the fingertip. They need to rely on their natural spatial awareness of each key locations. These are the touch point distributions of 26 keys with 95% confidence ellipse. It is surprising to see centuries of 26 keys form a QWERTY layout, indicating that it is still possible to type within a QWERTY keyboard, though the input might be very imprecise. Besides QWERTY, what else layout should we consider? We decided to investigate those grid layouts with grouping, just like T9 keyboard on traditional cell phones, and apply statistical decoder too. Notice that grouping will introduce inherent clarity issues that cannot be well addressed by the statistical decoder. For example, when user wants to type word fork, F-O-G, he press the first key, the second key, and then the third key. Then the decoder may find that beside word fork, word corp also matches the entered key sequences. This kind of clarity issue may lead to an inherent additional cost on the selection time among candidate lists. So layouts with grouping is not necessarily better than the original QWERTY keyboard. The keyboard can be divided into grids in so many different ways. 
we want to have as few keys as possible to improve the tapping precision. At the same time, a smaller number of keys will introduce a more serious clarity problem. To strike a balance between them, we picked three grid layouts which don't have a very serious clarity issue, neither too many keys. A similar user study was conducted to collect data for grid layouts. The only difference is that the task is pointing selection rather than typing phrases. This is because letters haven't been assigned to keys, so real typing is not feasible at this time. These are the distributions for grid layouts. We can see users can differentiate keys much better than Cody layout, pro uh, providing a higher chance that user can tap every key precisely. In some layouts, letters may shift away from their original locations, which makes it hard for users to rely on their existing muscle memory. For the sake of learnability, we applied an additional criterion that letters must follow their original location strictly. We have 50 grid layouts that satisfy our condition. So, the candidate layouts for the simulation has finally been determined, including a standard Cody layout, 16 layouts in a 1 by 5 grid, 32 layout in a 2 by 3 grid, and 2 layout in a 3 by 2 grid. The best layout is in a 2 by 3 grid layout. Compared with the standard Cody keyboard, the best layout can have nearly 82%, about 11% more words to be appearing among the top three of the suggestion list. Next, I'm going to talk about the prototype of TipTax. What you are looking at is the tattoo version of interactive skin we implemented. It is ultra thin, very easy and comfortable to wear. This is ideally what we want. However, it is too fragile for our user study. So we developed another FPC version prototype. It is strong and robust enough for our user study. This is also the one you will see in the following slides. Here's a quick demo of typing hello world with tip text. We, conduct, we conducted a user evaluation to evaluate tip text. 12 participants were engaged to go through four blocks where each block contains 10 phrases. All test phrases were randomly picked from McKenzie's test set. Here are the results for text entry speed. The X axis shows different blocks, and the Y axis shows the text entry speed using word per minute as a measurement. The curve over four blocks shows the performance improvement. The average speed on the first block was 10.5 WPM. It went up to 30.3 WPM in the last block with an average of 11.9 WPM over all blocks. Here are the results for total error rate and uncorrected error rate. The X axis shows different blocks and the Y axis shows two types of error rate. Total error rate including corrected errors and uncorrected errors. Corrected errors are the ones entered but corrected by users. Uncorrected errors are the errors in the committed text. As you can see here, the total error rate dropped after practice over time. The uncorrected error rate maintained a low level over all blocks. That's it for tip text. I'm going to wrap up my talk by presenting you some future work and make some conclusions. There are several things we can do. First, we want to evaluate tip text in more mobile scenarios, such as working or hold something in hand. Tip text also needs to be more efficient among different users. To achieve this, an adaptive personalized statistical decoder can be developed to further fit different typing habits of different users. Finally, further functions are essential for tip text to be more deployable. Our current system only supports inputting existing words in dictionary, while in real situations, users may want to have punctuations or other words too. With that, I want to conclude our work and give you some take home messages. First, I've presented a micro sample text entry technique 
based on a miniature invisible keyboard residing on the index finger. Second, we carefully designed an optimal keyboard layout for tip text, and we proved that grouping is better than 26 keys. Third, we conducted a user study and showed that typing speed on tip text can be up to 13.3 WPM. Tip text is fast, natural, and unobtrusive. It can even be carried out in a pocket. We believe it's uh, we believe in its bright future in many applications. I want to take this opportunity to thank all our co-authors again. This is all I want to share for today, and I'm more than happy to take any question. Thank you. I know we're going into break time, but if you can stay for a couple of minutes, uh, we can do questions. Shuming Jai, congratulations for the Best Paper Award, and also congratu congratulations for the successful collaboration. Jake here was saying, well, 20 authors, we've never seen that in text entry. And, I can, and later on he said, I can see why they, are, they have so many collaborators, and successfully, that which is really to be congratulated, uh, including both people in the industry as well as uh, in academia in different regions, like Xiaojun worked on my team, on uh, real product development. So he's very uh, deep, have deep insight into how actual commercial keyboards is developed, and I see some of the impact in here. So that's very successful collaboration. I want to want ask a specific question you only alluded to, that is this finger uh, form, two fingers, is possibly the strongest form of proprioception. You don't use that word, uh, that meaning your body has a sense about there are different body parts relative to each other. And that seems to be a huge advantage that you are leveraging to some degree, but uh, like in your data collection stage. But in actual use, you wrap around uh, a sensor around the finger, which, which reduces the profile section. Um, I wonder if you can speculate on that in terms of further improvement on the performance of it. The performance still seems to be kind of low on around 10, 11 words per minute. Uh, so our, uh, this work is mainly focused on the text entry part, and we're assuming that uh, in the near future, we are going to have a reliable and promising uh, sensing technique. So, uh, so, but we also want to have our contributions of the keyboard design approach to go beyond the sensing technique. That's why we are going to, uh, we, we used uh, we used Vicon and Unity in the uh, first user study because we want to eliminate the effect of the uh, interactive skin, which is an uh, overlay on your fingertips. So we want to make this contribution more general and beyond the sensing technique. So, but in the, in the user evaluation, we just have a proof of concept prototype to show, okay, so on such a uh, prototype, we can achieve uh, performance like uh, uh, 11, 13. Uh, so I think uh, this is why we use different, uh, different sensing techniques in two user studies. One last quick question and then Jerv will be around for a bit in the break as well. Hi, Lisa Elkin, University of Washington. So I'm sitting here beside my advisor and we're kind of comparing thumb sizes and also surface area for the keyboard. And I was wondering if you thought about resizing um, the grid spacing based on someone's finger size because obviously there's a correlation between like their thumb size and sort of you could um, automatically calibrate for the fat finger problem for individual people. Yeah. So uh, actually for now we have, uh, we measured uh, user's finger size before the experiment and all the data we collected are re uh, relative to user's finger size. So it is possible for uh, for uh, different users with small finger or large fingers, uh, they may, uh, the grid layouts may, the best grid layout for, for them may be different. Uh, we may explore the, this possibility in our future work. I think this is a very good idea. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, hey, thank you, Sher. And let's give a big round of applause to all our speakers. Oh, and please remember to vote for the best talks. Uh, there's boxes outside the room. Thank you.